but we don't have enough pressure to do so. We don't have enough encouragement for you know for for people to think about these issues and to begin to address them. Instead, there are so many incentives to become part of the influencers who say vote this, vote that, you know, and 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 so on and so forth, rather than begin to think, you know, how this how how to unite this nation against the problems which we face as a nation and beyond um, the, 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 these, these national problems. There are so many ho- a host of problems for us to address. Professor K.S. Jomo is one of Asia's most prominent economists of our time, having spent much of his career uh, examining the challenges besetting the growth and development of emerging market economies, both here in Asia as well as in Africa. His analysis has almost always been juxtaposed and analysed in the context of the policies practised and fomented by some of the world's richest countries in Europe and North America, uh, often pointing out the inconsistencies between the two regions. At a personal level, uh, the one thing I share in common with Professor Jomo is that we both hail from the island state of Penang in northern Malaysia. It's an extremely multicultural place, Penang, a historical melting pot, She's been a centre of trade since at least the 18th century, uh, maybe more, and Penang gave us the ability and open-mindedness to accept and to explore uh, the many different ideas and principles our colourful world and her people offers up. We had a lively to and fro, Professor Jomo and I, uh, traversing many different topics and ideas, which I hope will be of interest to at least some of you. And so, dear viewers, here is my conversation with Professor Jomo, where we talked about the myriad number of challenges that face us in emerging Malaysia, ASEAN, and the rest of the world, and what we can hope to do about it, maybe at an individual level, as well as a, perhaps a national level. Prof Jomo, thank you for doing this. It's a great honour and a great privilege to have you here. If we can, let's start at the, um, you know, in the early part of your life, when, um, I mean, we are fellow Penangites, right? And uh, you went from Westlands to then, I think, Free School, then Royal Military College, RMC, then on to, I think, uh, uh, Yale and then Harvard, right? Um, bring us back to those days when you were in, you know, your late teens, early 20s. And then you go from basically what was then a very small little backwater of an island to basically the, the, the home of education. What were those days like for you? Well, one of the things about Penang is that Penang is quite pretentious, Okay. The slogan of Penang is Penang leads, you know, and and uh, Penang was the home of Penang Free, of Penang Free School, where Free School thought that it was the first school in Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of pretensions in Penang, and uh, so my choice to go to RMC was uh, considered a bit unusual, and two of my closer friends joined me to going going to RMC. And uh, so we, we actually did um, make a decision. Uh, there were a few others from free school who had also made a similar decision before that, uh, some of whom remain very close friends to this day. Now, um, the, the, I, I thoroughly enjoyed growing up in Penang, partly because of where I lived. I lived in an area which was um, very, very multicultural. I lived in front of two Buddhist temples. One was Thai and the next, the other one was Chinese. Two very different conceptions of the Buddha. What part of town was this? Perak Road, the oh. big, near Burma Road. So you have the, 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 the Thai Buddha who is sitting in lotus position, you know, and 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 then you have next to that you have the Chinese Buddha, um, kind of obese, um, and and basically you know very jolly, uh, and, and and so on and so forth. And then later on, a couple in 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 1972, I came uh, overland and in I, I stopped in in Lahore in Pakistan. I was stuck because. There was a war between Pakistan and India, and there was only one way, one flight a week uh, from Pakistan to India. It's the shortest flight in my life. I think it took about less than fifteen minutes from Lahore to Amritsar, which is basically about sixty kilometers or sixty miles apart. But I had a lot of time in Lahore, so I went to the Lahore Museum, which is really a gem of a museum. 
and it has the collection from Mohenjo-daro. And Mohenjo-daro was a very important Buddhist civilization. And, uh, and uh, there, there is actually a very interesting uh, history to, to Mohenjo-daro. But to cut a long story short, the images of the Buddha are really ascetic images of a, sort of a, a fasting, maybe even a starving Buddha. So you basically can see all the ribs. That's unusual. Yeah, because <laughs> the no, Buddhas no, no, it's not. Are... It's not unusual if if you if you look at the the images of the Buddhas uh, and Bodhisattvas uh, in in in. So you have very three three very very um, very different uh, depictions. So you begin to realize how you know how at a, from a very early age you begin to realize how. Where you sit affects how you see things, and you know, and in a way, where, where you stand on many things. Yeah. So this multiculturalism is quite evident in your life. I mean, as you say, yeah. you grew up in front of two temples of different, you know, nationalities. And hundred and, and hundred meters away, there was uh, uh, the first uh, women's uh, girls uh, madrasa in in in, oh. in 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 Malaya okay. and Penang is definitely uh, yeah yeah and uh, you know so so and then behind me was the Anglican vicarage and uh, a, a statue of of uh, of Queen Victoria uh, at at the corner of Burma Road and 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 Pankow Road yeah which uh, is uh, CRC right yes, you can see the yeah, statue there yeah, yeah. so then a lot of people don't realize that actually you have uh, two african names in your in your name KS Jomo Kwame Sundrum, right? Mm. And then you go to America and you go to Harvard, you go to Yale and you're surrounded by what are now very esteemed economists, right? Mm. So so how how does that background and, and being in the company of these, you know, economic giants of economics, you know, how do they inform you and how you think about economic development and economics, the study of economics? Well, I um I was in what in the in in those days we used to be called the double maths class you know sort of before you go do engineering and things like that and uh, but i was quite interested to understand economics and I, I i i would read a few books here and there and uh then took an exam and then went to study economics and i specifically asked to be affiliated to a particular college within yale uh, called Berkeley, where the master was a man named Robert Triffin, who basically was one of the earliest um, uh, analysts of the international monetary system as it was evolving. Later, he became known for something called the Triffin Dilemma. And uh, another thing he was very well known for was, was calling the system which emerged after uh, a year after I arrived in America, uh, in in August 1971, um, uh, Richard Nixon pulled out of the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, and that was the end of the international monetary system, which had prevailed since 1944. So it was a very very, it was a very uncertain world, a world where you know nothing seemed to be, everything seemed to be in flux, nothing was certain, and uh, and uh, he called that a Triffin called that a non-system. And it's it really forces you to begin to think, you know, what, what happens when you no, no longer have uh, something, anything agreed upon, you know, and there was a great deal of chaos. And now reflect, reflecting back some of the things which the Malaysian government did at that time were actually quite pragmatic, you know, for example, uh, making uh, agreements with countries like India and Pakistan and the Soviet Union and China to to sell uh, palm oil you know which couldn't which um, which could could not be allowed to to be sold in 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 which could not be sold in in uh, Europe okay because Europe uh, kept on escalating tariffs to prevent refined Malaysian palm oil from entering Europe so so you know so this is a world where no no you know, you despite all the talk about free trade and all the ret that kind of rhetoric, uh, people were not playing by those rules. There was one, there was a rhetoric, and there was reality, and one needed to make sense of it. So, one be begins to realize that, you know, what you learn, the received wisdom, so to speak, uh, 
in 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 the academic world was not something you could take for granted you know you you, ha- you learned how to be skeptical if you want to understand the world you have to be skeptical about the received knowledge you think you have and and not be be uh, car- to to not believe it too much you know you begin to th- to look at you use it rather in in a, in a way which is rather yeah for want of a better term skeptical and and that i think was very important in forcing me to think about uh, uh, differently about the world yeah i mean we talk in the current times about being you know full of volatility but and fear and uncertainty and doubt and all that but in the 70s i mean i think not soon after he t- nixon took the americans off the bretton woods agreement he also took the us dollar off the gold standard and that precipitated, I guess, the decline since then in some small measure. Then, of course, the 70s was a time of huge inflation. The Volcker era, I think he raised interest rates to somewhere near 20%, um, unprecedented since then. And, and and I mean, now we think that inflation is out of control and blah, 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 but it's been happening for years, right? Um, how, how do you, you know, kind of like, um, how do you understand what's going on in terms of dealing with the uncertainties of this world and in terms of trying to map out a cause you know, in, in, in your in your writings and in your in your advice to the governments, you know, how do you try try and pass through the you know, the many data points of information and try to make sense of what's going on and try and map out the future? How how do you do that? I mean, how did that that era where you went to school in, in Penang and, and the Yale and so the Harvards of this world, you know, the Trippians of this world, and then try to make sense of what's going on? I think um one thing which I've developed an appreciation of, although I never went, I never took any classes in history beyond Form Three, you know, is is a, a greater appreciation for for history, and how in many ways many things are set because certain things have happened before that. You know, it's not as if everything is random and everything you, one has a, has choices about everything. One ha, one has limited choices. Pre- Precisely because of what has gone on before that, okay. So, so I think it's very important for us to 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 remember the importance of history, and no, I'm not saying that everything is predetermined by history, but I think there are limited choices precisely because of what has gone on before that. So, I developed a, a, a healthy appreciation of that. I developed a healthy appreciation, I think of the fact that you know we were colonized despite what some historians would claim that we were never colonized and so on the fact of this country was colonized and shaped this country in very important ways it shaped what we did what we didn't do for example the understanding of colon of food security in colonial period was basically motivated by the desire of the british to maximize the amount of foreign exchange which malaya earned for it because you basically wanted to have as much foreign exchange as possible to keep up the gold standard in the interwar in the interwar years for example you know so you begin to realize that and 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 then you begin to realize for example in the de- half decade or so after world war 2 malaya contributed 70% of the foreign exchange earnings of the entire british empire because britain had been devastated by by Hitler's bombings and all that. Brit- there was no British industry to speak of because of what Hitler had done. So there was nothing they, they could s- s- produce, let alone sell, to earn. So it was it was the colonies and especially Malaya because India and Pakistan and so on were getting the in- Sri Lanka, got their independence around that time. So you begin to realize how many things were de- determined, were shaped by these kinds of considerations which 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 um which shape relations in the world in in very profound and sometimes enduring ways and this i think was 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 very important now going back you you raised the question of what paul volcker did paul volcker was the chairman of the federal reserve he uh, beginning from the very early uh, from from the early 1980s pushed up interest rates very high uh, because there was inflation but and there was also stag- stagnation 
Now, did he overcome that stagnation? No. He actually made the stagnation deeper. And, uh, and uh, you know, um, the many countries in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, suffered a great deal. Sub-Saharan Africa was in stagnation for a quarter of a century from, from the late 1970s. Uh, Latin America, they lost at least a decade. Some people would argue even two decades uh, for, uh, during the 80s and 90s, precisely because of Volcker pushing up interest rates. So here, now, we see a similar situation. You know, the US Federal Reserve says that they must push up in, uh, interest rates because of inflation which has happened, which is slightly over 2%. Okay, and why did that happen? It happened precisely because you have, um, you know, you 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 have uh, a variety a variety of what economists call supply side disruptions. Okay, first due to the pandemic, and then more recently, of course, due to war, and following with the with the with the ukraine war you have sanctions which have been imposed particularly on 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 um, on russia and its allies and so and then you have the cold war uh, and and sanctions which have been imposed on china and and so on so all these are not are not necessary they are the result of public policy choices made by the protagonists involved so all this has basically caused the world economy to, to, on the one hand, inflation on the one hand, but at the same time, you have the forces of economic stagnation. So what, what do we do in this kind of situation? Why do we need to continue to raise interest rates? Why? Because according to uh, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, he says that we must get down to 2%. Where did this 2% come from? Well, <laughs> the story, real story is, it, you cannot find it in economic theory. You cannot find it in empirical analysis. It comes out of the fact that in 1989, the, the finance minister of New Zealand was dealing with, the, with inflation which was may, maybe low double digits or maybe even high single digits. Okay? And he thought it was a good idea to bring down inflation low. So he 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 talked to the to the to the chairman of the what their central bank they call it the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and he said, you know, two by 92, 1992 would be a, a sounds like a good slogan. And so he set the target inflation target at two percent by 1992. He gave himself three years. And what has happened since then? Two by two, two percent has been universally accepted as the inflation target for the world, and who and, and on what basis? There's no analytical basis. There's no theoretical basis. There's no empirical basis for this arbitrary two percent target. But this obsession with pushing it down, because if you look at what has happened in the in the U.S., okay. Prices went up tremendously from around March to June 2022, and since then it has not it has it has not gone down. Prices have not gone down to the earlier levels, but they have certainly not continued to accelerate. Does it does it perplex you, Prof? That um, you've got people in the Federal Reserve, basically their central bank, who are in charge of the price of money and the supply of money. And when they reduce interest rates to basically near zero from the late 2009 era to about 2021, 2020, they have about 10, 11 years of essentially free money. Um, you are going to get an inflation of, of everything, of assets, of prices, of the cost of goods and everything contained within that, that sphere, right? And, and then, and then they, they, they try and raise interest rates initially, which they then pulled back from, but then they eventually did. And then they raise interest rates by basically 500 basis points in the space of one year. And that's caused a lot of problems around the world. Does it perplex you sometimes, Prof, because you, you've been around you know, economic his, um, giants, right, economist giants, that for the Federal Reserve Force, who is populated by so many very clever people, I think at last count something like 80 PhDs in the Fed, right, that they can get something so monumentally wrong 
and not understand the ramifications of what they're doing. Or I do they know what they're doing, but they're doing it deliberately in a concerted way? Firstly, I don't think the number of PhDs you have in the Federal Reserve actually impinges on, in, on, on policy. The policy is made by a very, very small cohort. The 10 okay. or 15 Fed governors. Even less than that. Mm. Okay, All you need is a simple majority. And although the governors seem to be equal, New York actually carries two votes. Okay, But at the end of the day, it is the chairman who prevails. So the vice chair of the US Federal Reserve now, a woman by the name of Lael Brainard, she actually dissents. She's actually been saying for, for months now that, that, that we should stop trying to, to raise interest rates. And at one time, Powell even dissented a little bit. But there is now this view where, where everybody, all central bank governors, all feel that they need to, 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 be, to be tough on raising interest rates, to be seen to be tough because you don't want capital flight from your country. The conventional thought is that the Federal Reserve is doing what it's doing now because they're trying to recover lost credibility. They were too late to raise interest rates. So they were, they were seen as being um, misinterpreting the impact of inflation when I think Jay Powell said it's going to be transitory, right? That's the conventional thought. The non-conventional thought is that the Fed is doing what it's doing because they're trying to impose an alternative system of currency. Uh, but they and they are allowing the collapse of the economy, the U.S. economy and the global economy. They are allowing the collapse of the U.S. dollar because they want to move on to another system. That is the alternative thought. What do you think about that? I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories very easily. I didn't say I said uh, alternate. <laughs> well, that's pretty much a conspiracy yeah. theory of sorts. Yeah. I, I I don't subscribe to that. Neither do I subscribe, you know, that, to the view that it's it's all driven by a single factor and so on and so forth. I think you basically, the politics of the Federal Reserve are quite complex and always changing. Um, and in and in this case, I, I, I don't no longer spend a lot of time watching, you know, watching the Fed. So I, I'm not in a position to comment on it. But as far as the world is concerned, you can see herd behavior. Okay? No central bank governor wants to be seen to be wanting uh, in, in, in the sense of not, do, not doing the, the, the new conventional wisdom. But I want to correct you on one thing. It was not as if prices, prices were going up, uh, consumer prices were going up during the period of low interest rates. No, far from it. In, fa in fact, the, the miracle of QE was that consumer prices were not going up. What was going up instead was asset prices. And asset prices went up principally because you had cheap money, easy money. So you had easy money and who could borrow, right? Who has good credit rating? Precisely people who have money, right? So they could borrow even more. They had access to easy money. They were buying assets from one another. And so you don't have real growth. That money which was, which was circulating was not being invested in the real economy. So you don't have real growth. Instead, you have asset price inflation. And this, I think, we, one, one, we need to think and differentiate between different types of inflation. So you can have consumer price inflation, you can have producer price inflation, you can have asset price inflation. You can, nowadays people talk about sort of, sort of profit-driven inflation because you have additional profits being made by, by, by certain people. I would say that all those factors have, have, have a role to play, but the, this recent period, the decade plus since, since the global financial crisis has been largely driven by the, 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 the success, if you want to put it that way, the Western success with QE in, insofar as consumer prices did not go up, but you had uh, basically, basically you had uh, uh, asset prices going up. Well, well, what about the impact of the, okay, I'm going to put this in two parts, right? What about the impact on the value of the US dollar because of the, of the inflation of the money supply? When the Federal Reserve keeps printing as much as it does, the value of the dollar in terms of its buying power diminishes, right? So what might have cost, say, $100 to buy a washing machine might then have cost $300 to buy a washing machine by the end of the early twenty, you know, early twenty nineteen, twenty twenty period, that that's one thing. So 
the buying power would have di diminished, thereby raising the cost of goods, I think, in, in some sense, and services. But the one thing I want to also raise with you, Prof, is, is you uh, earlier referenced the, the prospect of conflict, right? And the, the, this, is, this has got... Um, this divide between the rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, has caused, has caused a lot of social strife in America. And, and it's caused a lot of social disturbances, and people have drawn parallels to the late 1930s in, in, in post-war Germany, and which then gave the rise of you know people like Adolf Hitler and other ethno-populist uh, dictators in the era like Stalin and, and of course, Mussolini in, in Italy, right? Um, we are seeing the rise of ethno-populist um, um, influences in all parts of the world, including in Malaysia, right? I, I want to speak to you as, as a layman, right, Prof? How, how do we deal with this you know, return, you know, this this repetition of history, as we like to call it, right? Because as history repeats itself. How do we, as a, as a normal human being, fathers, sons, entrepreneurs, business people, how do we deal with this in terms of rationalizing what to do next? That's a, that's a crucial question, but I just want to 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 clarify something which, which we discussed earlier. And that is, just because you're printing a lot of money, doesn't mean that inflation is happening. It doesn't mean that, that the, the costs of goods are going up. Consumer price inflation was not going up significantly during this period. That was the so-called miracle of QE, that they, they, were, they were issuing a lot of money without doing so. And we have to recognize that confidence in the US has got nothing to do with how much money is circulating. How much money is circulating depends on whether there's a demand for dollars. And the whole world, the demand for dollars has been there uh, since 1971. So it's not as if it has collapsed. At some points, the, the confidence in the dollar goes up. At some points, it goes down. But it, that in and of itself is a, is a subject of, of many things. So I think one needs to begin to think of what some people call soft power. You know, it's not something to be taken for granted. But let's go back to the, the to the, your very very important question, and that that is the the nature of inequality, of social conflicts, and and the rise of ethnopopulism. You know, many people used to think that when you have um, increasing inequality or increasing perceptions of inequality, growing social conflicts, and so on, you are bound to have a better world. Unfortunately, we should know from history that that is not necessarily the case. How can it be a better world? Well, people would say that you know the, the 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 poor, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the exploited, the impoverished are going to resent it so much, and they are going to push for a better world. Okay, and 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 th this is this is a popular scenario among many people, and they they all, would all like to think that every time you have an economic crisis, something better will come out of it. And that's not necessarily the case as we know. And, and I think your referencing of the 1930s is very, very appropriate. So you can have a situation, the Gilded Age of the 1920s, uh, and, and which, which results in, in a whole series of problems where the most effective form of mobilization is populism. And a certain type of populism, which which seeks to mobilize on the basis of perceived commonalities and imagined community, if you want to put it that way, an imagination that you have a common shared heritage of either associated with ethnicity, with language, with religion, and so on and so forth. So we have seen at a time when, especially since the end of the Cold War, we have seen the rise of ethnopopulism, you know, all over the all over the world. In in the Western world, we have seen, for example, you know, uh, the, you remember there was a Dutch politician named Pim Fortin, who 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 had become uh, very very racist, and and you know, Holland was once considered to be the one of the most anti-racist societies in Europe. 
and and you know PIM14 and others uh, changed that. And you've also seen the rise of uh, of uh, Le Pen, senior and junior, Marine Le Pen, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and her father before that. You know, um, uh, and 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 the rise of AFD in uh, in in Deutschland, in in Germany, Germany, and and so on and so forth. So you have seen ethno populism rear its head there, but you've also seen it elsewhere. If you think about the Bolsonaro phenomenon in 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 Brazil, and and uh, elsewhere, and so you you find a great deal of mobilization on either ethnic grounds, on 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 shared linguistic grounds, on religious grounds, on sectarian grounds, and so on and so forth. This is precisely what we have seen a great deal of in 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 recent decades and so and this lends itself to a mobilization and b- because you you begin to have a sense of of um of the perception of society of history which is all colored by this type of thing yeah and yeah, sorry, Prof. Um, so I I know you've you know obviously you would have studied Keynes, Samuel Major Keynes, the the British economist, uh, in, in in great detail. Now, there is a body of thought which says that market economics, which is I think the system that we are currently using in many parts of the world in the West and even in Malaysia, um, it it creates uns- it creates inequalities because of the way it, it the system works, right? It 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 encourages entrepreneurialism. It encourages companies, encourages profits, encourages margins, and and the system rewards entrepreneurs uh, in in great in great deal, and it doesn't reward wage earners because wage earners are basically people who work for the entrepreneurs, right? But wage earners are not um, able to via their salaries, and and the very bad poor w- wage growth to purchase assets, and the purchase of assets is what, and the monetization of those assets and the use of leverage and things like that will allow the business owners and the asset owners to get rich at a much faster pace than the wage earners. So then the, the system that we're using now, the school of thought goes, rewards the entrepreneurs, penalizes the wage earners, thereby creating these inequalities in the systems, and then results in huge, of course, pockets of dissent within society, which then allows ethno-populists to come to the fore and then to spread the word. I mean, of course, Hitler in the 1930s Mussolini in the in the, in, the, in Italy was was you know obviously um, quite famous examples of those lah, and we see those in Malaysia and the rest of the world today. Is the system broken? Do we need to rethink the way we look at business and development and things like that, Prof? So Chong, you did a brilliant job of summarizing the kind of thinking which uh, which which has long dominated, um, you know, in in the sense that. There, there, there has been the expectation of growing social conflict, and that growing social conflict would somehow lead to a better world. But it doesn't. Okay. Though. History yeah, has proven exactly, that, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. So the, the 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 challenge then is how do we explain that growing social conflict, and then that turn, you, which you correctly identified towards ethno populism. Okay, that turn. Is precisely what needs to be explained. Why has why have societies developed in that particular way? And here, I think we need to look at human agency. We, here, we need to look at the role of politics. Here, we need to ro- look at the role of of thought thought leaders. How thought leaders contribute to this wittingly or unwittingly by fomenting, by encouraging particular forms of thinking which lend themselves to ethno populism. So certain ideas become much more significant precisely because because they serve, uh, you know, the ideas have always been there, you know, but but they precisely because they serve particular ends at particular moments in time, they are invoked, they are mobilized, and become extremely influential. And this, I think, is a, is the real challenge to understand the world and in understanding Malaysia. You know, this is very, very relevant. Why do we think uh, so that uh, preci- precisely because of what what I would say say as ethno-populist solutions? And ethno-populism is so profound and strong and influential in this country that the discourses are all essentially ethno-populist. Uh, 
there are different variants of ethnopopulism, but they are fundamentally ethnopopulist. Even and and this is part of the problem we have in Malaysia, because there is no alternative discourse of and 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 why why we have the kinds of politics we have seen over the last half decade, for example. And we need to begin to think about about how we how we begin to get beyond that and to begin to address the problems of the world, the real world out there, including the, the world in our, in, in, our, in our country. Because we have seen, for example, for over a quarter of a century since the, since the, uh, since 97, 98, since the financial crisis of 97, 98, this country has been quite moribund. We have seen the failure of the economy to, to revive. The, we have seen a premature uh, deindustrialization. We have seen the emergence of uh, of of uh, th this perception, this this unfounded belief that somehow or other we are going to reach this that we have reached a tertiary uh, stage of growth. We have moved beyond secondary industrialization, and that we are now into services. Services are the future. And we are going to have these these very high end services, when in fact many of the services, undoubtedly services have grown in this country, but most of the services which have grown have been so called traditional services. You know, when we think about about, uh, for example, the huge proliferation of uh, food deliveries, that's a service. But is food delivery a high end service? Obviously not. Yeah, the Do fact that you're using a few, a, a, your your smartphone or whatever for communications doesn't make it a high-end service. No, it's not rocket science. Prof, do you think that part of the problem lies in, in well, I mean, I definitely in terms of the deficit of thought leaders and alternative thought, um, do you think that part of the problem lies in the way of the, the, the system of government that we practice, in, including in many parts of the world, which is democracy, right? And democracy is basically the process of, of, of accumulating votes by saying popular things. No, it's it's essentially a beauty contest. It's a popularity contest. And popularity contests are predicated on the people who say things which resonate and let's just admit it, to people of an insecure nature. You know, whether it's uh, someone taking your jobs or whether it's someone taking your livelihood or whether it's someone threatening you the way you, you practice, the way you live life and, and et cetera, et cetera. That's part of the problem. And I think if we had an alternative way of establishing our leaders, that might be another way forward. Because at this point in time, we are possibly seeing the return of Trump in America, and we know what he might stand for, right? We, we see this process happening all over the world, in Europe as well, as you mentioned, right? Marine Le Pen in France, you know, in Germany as well, the ADP, I think, is the party, right? AFP. And in, AF, mm -hmm. Yeah. And in Malaysia as well. Mm -hmm. We don't have an alternative system of government. A Scandinavian one seems interesting, but it's not something which is, you know, uh, might be accommodated in many parts of the world because of its um, lenient nature? What, what do you think about that? Well, I, 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 I guess I have to take issue with two, two arguments, which are very important. Yeah. One, that market forces necessarily lead to, to the kinds of problems which we discussed earlier. And secondly, that democracy uh, leads to, to, to these uh, similar uh, related problems. Uh, let's, let's, let's go back to, to market, the market first. Um, I think markets, you know, Keynes once said something to the effect of, you know, the, the market can be a wonderful handmaiden, but do not let it be the master. Okay? In other words, the market can be very, very important in terms of distributing all kinds of things, you know. But once you allow the market to dominate, to dictate, then we are in trouble. And it's precisely this. So I think it is not the market in and of itself, but the system of property rights relating to the market, which, which is camouflaged by mark, the market in a sense, which is the problem. So you have all kinds of property rights, including ones which are newly invented. So for example, what are intellectual property rights? There's something invented within my own lifetime. You know, intellectual prop. No, who who talked about intellectual property rights before the nineteen eighties, for example? You know, but intellectual property rights are now the single largest source of wealth 
for most of the richest people in the world okay whether it you know be, be mr bezos or you know the, the let's not go through Tomacani, the list for example yeah exactly yeah. so you 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 have you know th- these property rights which are just created by the by law you know you know we often talk oh we want a world of law and order but what does it mean when law you know you, you have the golden rule who has the gold makes the rules right mm. and then you have a world of law and order where the law you get ordered around because of the of law which prevails so i think we have to be very very careful about many of these categories you know um so i don't see the market in and of itself being hugely problematic so you're, you're saying the system is fine no 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 ha- fine, hardly i but, but i think it's, it's a long way stretch it's to, to prevail and dominate which is the problem no i think i think what what happens is that the 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 market market forces market mechanisms can be very useful in terms of resolving a lot of information problems okay uh it doesn't mean however that that you allow the market to dictate because be, the market is not something which exists in a vacuum the market exists in a situation where some of us have many more assets much more influence than others so if i you know someone who has much more assets is able to determine for example what you have in the media what you have in terms of 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 the distribution of property of dictating what happens of buying influence in an in 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 most uh, uh, electoral systems uh, in fact in in the U- in in the US Supreme Court has upheld the right of corporations uh, to 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 uh, basically participate in el- politically you know so you you have um, a, a you know but this in and of itself is not something which is inherent to markets So I think that you know that that fighting with a market economy is not the 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 thing to do what needs to be done is to challenge the power which is camouflaged which is masked by the market and this I think is is, is extremely important because a lot of people say the market for oh is just due to market forces okay and what does it mean when you think about market forces what are the market forces they are speaking of and very often they are the, the they are forces because of the un, this un, unequal and undemocratic distribution of power often in the form of property rights but also sometimes in the form of 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 politics so if you have an a a a, a a people who are able to buy influence okay precisely because of of the, the because the system allows to do so not to say that is because of the market i think that that's a bit of a stretch well i mean the, the inequality that exists in the system is in some small or large part because of the distribution of wealth caused by the market economy which is i think the, the school of thought that that suggests this right mm. but but the common man or the common common person to object and to rail against this system which seems to be so powerful and so influential historically has come in the form of some form of military conflict some sort of kinetic war like if you like mm-hmm. prof right we've seen that many many times in history this is something that you've also voiced concern about that we are sitting on the on the verge of some conflagration of sorts whether it's going to be digital or whether it's going to result in some kind of kinetic conflict that seems to be the risk today how do we prevent that how do we deal with this this big behemoth of a system which seems to be so powerful and so omnipresent i think um there are no short and easy answers to that very very complex question lemen lemen reply at at two or three levels i think we have a situation where the power of the merchants of war is grossly underestimated 
and often obscured by the pretense of national security considerations. So we don't know. So when, when even Eisenhower, a former general, warned in 1960 or 61, as he was stepping down as president, he warned of the power of the military-industrial complex. What few people know is that in the original draft, he said military-industrial-congressional complex. So he was also referring to the politics, okay, not just to the military-industrial complex. And he was quite prescient. And especially for a general to reflect on that, after all, he was no ordinary general. He was the commander of the of the U.S. forces in 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 Europe in the in the main theater of war. So I think I think Eisenhower's insight has been very very important. Now in our country and many other countries, many decisions are not subject to public scrutiny because of so-called national security considerations. Many in many societies, we do not have access to that kind of information. The people who go around promoting whatever they promote do so quite easily, precisely because they 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 they, they operate in the shadows, you know, outside of, of of public scrutiny, and that's why, if you look at the 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 work of the this uh, journalist, uh, South African journalist Anthony Sampson, the Arms Bazaar. The margin of corruption involved in arms sales is much higher than any other business, precisely because of this obscurity. He have, his estimate is forty percent. Okay, that was the margin of corruption involved in, in 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 arms sales. Now this was many years, many decades ago. I'm not even sure that it, the 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 percentage has not gone up uh, since then. But the 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 point is that. We have that kind of impulse, which is extremely strong. And this is why you find in many societies a very strong inclination by those who would like to aggrandize themselves, become richer, to become people involved in arms procurement, in weapons procurement. That's why people look for, for, for ministries like the defense industry, uh, uh, like the defense ministry, precisely because of what it it, it confers upon them, and we we've, we've seen how 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 it has been abused uh, in the case of Malaysia as well, with all these ships which which have been built, which which don't even uh, function, um, uh, submarines which have been bought which don't function, and and so on and so forth. These are all these are basically uh, treasonous. I mean, the, the 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 net effect of what they are doing. Is basically treasonous. Not that I particularly want a war, but at another level, there is another problem, and that is the fact that you have a situation in the world where, even before Mr. Trump, but especially with Mr. Trump, he basically, in his brashness, pushed aside all existing agreements. Okay, so beginning with the end of the Soviet, with the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the first Cold War, okay, there was this moment of American triumphalism with the with the emerging unipolar world, where instead of saying we won the Cold War, let us now have peace. The doctrine of people like Mr. Wolfowitz and so on was precisely the converse. We need to extend and consolidate power in this unipolar world. And this was, you know, this was the 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 the, the popular view. And you know, it, it went by different names. Sovereignism was yet another name and so on, which was going around in, in the pages of foreign affairs and other influential places. These were extremely influential in particularly in the West and particularly in in in, in, in the US. Now, what on the on the other hand, with the end of the Soviet Union, with the rise of Mr. Yeltsin, with the ability to influence public policy in the in the former Soviet Union, within the course of three years, 
the Soviet economy, the, the Soviet economy, or the Russian economy in particular, was shrunk by half. Can you imagine an economy being cut by half within three years? And that was what basically uh, uh, was achieved by, by Mr. Yeltsin with a lot of help from, from, from across the Atlantic. Now, the result of the, all that is that when Putin decided to reverse this whole process, the rebuilding of the Russian economy was painful and certainly not fairer because all the oligarchs and others were all making, you know, making uh, mine, mine fields, um, sorry, mines for themselves. And they took their money out. So as the Russian economy slowly recovered and recovered about, finally recovered to its previous size only about a decade ago. Okay, it took about almost a quarter of a cent. Uh, well, certainly it took uh, a couple of decades for it for it to to recover. Now, when this happened, what does it basically mean? Very little, very few resources available to remilitarize. So it basically meant that the Russian economy has got very few new military capacities. So in the event of it being pushed, they have the easy the easiest thing to resort to is its old military capacities, which are built up during the first Cold War, which are basically nuclear. So we have the real threat of nuclear annihilation, partly due to legacy issues such as those, but partly due to the fact that, you know, the last few presidents of the United States have also been very trigger happy, button, they're ever ready to push the button or to threaten to push the button yeah. because all the restraints have been have been abandoned. Yeah, the Bush family, for example. Look, I mean, you know, Prof, you know, from, from your time, from the late 60s to the early 70s, I mean, we've, we've had basically 50 years of these news events where we've always been on, on the edge of something. I mean, the Bay of Pigs in Cuba in the early 60s, you would have seen that. The Vietnam War, you know, the, the Cold War between Reagan and, and, and the Russians. And there was always this threat of, like, the end of the world, right? Now, if I can get personal with you, you know, if you, you've just entered your, your seventh decade, right, Prof? And you have seen, you know, you've seen the world come and go. You've been around the block a couple of times. How do you make sense of what's going on with the world? How do you, as a, as a human being, try and um, navigate at, at a personal level this, this crazy world we live in? On this issue of annihilation, I am so worried. I've never been so worried in my life. Okay. Partly so, because perhaps because I spent um, almost a decade, well, over a decade working in the United Nations system. And I began to see, and, and, and you know, as an outside observer, I never saw many things, right? So as an insider, I began to see a lot of things happening. And what I kind of things did you see? You know, how how frivolous people are in making very profound de decisions and people with all kinds of prejudices. I mean, all, on all sides, okay? But the prejudice of an, an African diplomat is less consequential than than the prejudice of, of say... Of course, uh, of course, because they've got yeah. far less influence. Yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most likely, right, Prof? How would you rate the possibility of an escalation into a global conflagration today? Well, I'm not in a position to measure a lot of things, but I'm part of the reason I'm so troubled right now is because the you know there's something called the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and they have a, a, a so-called doomsday clock, where you know the doomsday clock is 24 hours. And they are now 90 seconds away from doom. 90 seconds. Never before have we been so close to, to, to apocalypse. Closer than at the Bay of Pigs, for example? Oh, B Bay of Pigs was really... The Bay of Pigs was not, not very consequential. I think what was very dangerous after that, which we never knew about for, for decades, was uh, when, the, when the Soviet submarine commander uh, 
was given the order to to attack the to attack any uh, enemy uh, uh, craft which attacked him. So this Soviet commander, the the actual submarine commander, refused to to that that, that command. Now this happened in nineteen right after Bay of Pigs. So Bay of Pigs was sixty one, and was basically I mean for those who are people like Jeffrey Sachs and so on who are very who are now who 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 see uh, Kennedy as the wisest, uh, and he was taken out, wasn't he? Yeah, he was taken out. I again, as I said, I'm not exactly a, a, a conspiracy theorist, but I probably come closest to being a conspiracy <laughs> theorist when you think about that. You know, Kennedy was going to do a lot of things. Yeah. He was going to see. He was going to meet Sukarno in 1964. You know. Uh, he, when, that would have been when, interesting, wouldn't it? In in early no, yes, of course. In early November, uh, the 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 president and and his wife of uh, of South Vietnam were killed. Were, you know all this, um, and before that, uh, in 1961, Doug Hammarskjöld was shot down. Um, there are so many things which have happened, which, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, many people have attributed to to um, you know uh, the 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 company as it is called in Latin America, the CIA, um, the and and the the and particularly the leadership of the younger brother of the Secretary of State, Mr. Alan Dulles, and no. it had ramifications in this part of the world, uh, for example, in the relations with Indonesia and so on and so forth. But going back, going back to 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 the, the the real threat. I mean, Daniel Ellsberg just died a few days ago. Um, he 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 spent the last few years of his life really warning about this. So a lot of people whom I have a lot of respect for, and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which actually has a very rigorous way of evaluating threat. Uh, you know, they have very solid grounds for being very concerned. So knowing what you know now and having, you know, gleaned all the data points in front of you, are you living a life differently today, Prof? I think um, insofar as I have a public, uh, not so much in this country, I, I, I probably have more more influence in in some other parts of the world, Anglophone world, admittedly, uh, but um, you know, I I I have spent the last few years and especially the last year talking about this threat much more than I have previously. I usually kept myself very much to the to I kept very much to to economic issues. Um, broadly speaking, yeah. In in, in publicizing your views, which in the past you haven't really been as public in in this regard, what is your panacea for for remedy? Is was there a panacea, or were you just trying to highlight the possibility? Um, I don't. I I often don't have enough time to to explain very much, so I usually. Don't offer. My, I guess my pr presumption is that making people aware would be sufficient to um, to cause them to 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 advise and inform others, especially their loved ones, about such. The threats and its likely implications, and perhaps to take some action. So, in 2020, there was a politician in the Trump cabinet who persuaded um, the prime minister of this country to uh, undertake joint naval patrols. Okay, as far as the American official was concerned, it is a question of um, of having an option to start a minor uh, start a minor skirmish to prevail for the US to prevail in that skirmish uh, 
Just as Mrs. Thatcher had started the Falklands War and won the Falklands War, so to speak, and won and and fought from a seemingly impossible position and won the two thousand sorry the the nineteen eighty three election in the U in the UK, you know she was considered to be a one term uh, prime minister before that, but with the Falklands War she managed to win. Likewise, George W. Bush was not likely to get re-elected in nineteen in in sorry in two thousand and three. Iraq After the Iraq War, war. and then yeah. so the proposition the proposition to Muhyiddin at the time was do this, you will get re-elected and you will be validated, and uh, you will become consecrated as prime minister. So no, I don't. I don't think to be fair, we don't we don't know enough of the details of what actually happened, but I think. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, didn't it, it didn't happen. Yeah. Partly when the when the when the two ministers from the foreign minister and the defense minister got wind of it, uh, they they and 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 they we managed to. Okay. So we pulled out of it. But the, at that time, the consideration by the Americans was that you know you not you didn't want to risk too much by start, starting a war with China. Or with Russia directly, or with, even with Iran, because too much was at stake. You wanted something small, maybe Venezuela, South China Sea, ma- South China Sea, <laughs> right. exactly, small, right? Yeah, little skirmish, right? Yeah. So they yeah. they wanted Malaysia to take sides. What you have advocated in the past is a regional, non-aligned, peaceful, uh, a block, perhaps ASEAN, right? Which at, at this point in time, in it it seems quite distant, lah, because we haven't been able to unify on many part, parts, right? So in terms of a remedy and a way forward, right, uh, Prof, how do we navigate this? Because at some point in time, we will have to take a side, or maybe we won't. But how do we come to that point? Quite frankly, I think we are actually, for all intents and purposes... We're doing a good job so far, no, right? No, no. I mean, ASEAN declared itself a zone of peace, freedom and neutrality, um, you know, five decades ago, half a century ago. This is what ASEAN has declared. It's an official position. Often, it, often many of the part- members of ASEAN don't do what they, they, they committed themselves to do, doing. But we are now, fortunately, within ASEAN, in a relatively decent position in the sense that, say, one of the countries which was in- most inclined to be pro one side or other in 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 this in this in the new cold war which is emerging is now less inclined to be so so we actually as far as asean is concerned i think we we are not in a bad place but i think what is needed is not something just at the asean level what we need right now is a uh, is the birth of a new non-line movement the reason i emphasize the newness of it is that we cannot just go back to the non-alignment of the first Cold War. The first Cold War was partly ideological, communism versus capitalism, etc., etc. This time it's not that. It's We are talking about varieties of capitalism. Okay, We are talking about varieties of capitalism. It's got nothing to do with that kind of grand ideology. And nobody seriously believes it's about democracy versus autocracy and so on. Nobody seriously believes that. So we are take, basically seeing two basically uh, struggles between spheres of influence and and in 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 the west macron among others represents some degree of dissent macron is no de gaulle he does not have the gravitas of a de gaulle and we cannot we cannot expect that he will go as far as de gaulle but there is some dissent in the west in the in the in in um, the rest of the world i think the our best hope is the birth of a non-aligned movement. Who drives and it? Which country? I think it's already happening in the sense, for example, in the preparations for the BRICS uh, discussion. Uh, but I think I think we cannot leave it to the big developing countries. We really need much more leadership, and it's precisely at that ki- at this kind of moment when we need that type of leadership that it is so wanting. We no longer have any Mandela's in the world. Could it be a Jokowi of Indonesia? 
could it be like a Tun Mahadi, as you say, you've asked him before to be the elder statesman. I think he may have, by his actions, declined to do that. Who, who drives it in ASEAN, Prof? Well, I, I'm, no, uh, I think, you know, Tun Mahadi has other priorities, okay? I, I, I regret that he has those kinds of priorities. I, I mean, you know, his legacy should be less less uh, solid than it's likely to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what his choice. We, there's nothing we can do. Um, Jokowi, you know, he's not going to be there for much longer. Um, and uh, his attempt to, to extend his term is, is unlikely to, to, to take place. I would like to think that, that Lula might provide some leadership. But the problem with Lula is that he does not have such an able... He had, in his earlier terms, he had very, very good people working and helping him on the uh, in, in international affairs. This time he's dealing with Salso Amorim, who is not comparable to his the people. There was a very, very competent guy named Marco Aurelio who was helping him uh, previously. Unfortunately, Marco Aurelio has passed away. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa does not have the gravitas or the vision or the ability to, to move forward. So I don't see any obvious candidate to, to, to provide that kind of leadership. And this is why precisely the smaller countries uh, have an important role to play, to fill this gap. And, uh, you know, uh, I, but I, I, it's, it's not clear where it should come. And in a sense, not, not having a big dominant figure can be an advantage because you then have a greater sense of participation. But there is still not enough momentum to push the, re, the birth of a new non-aligned movement for, forward. And it has to be not just non-aligned, it has to be pacifist because the threat of war is all too real. Contrarian thought for you, Prof, because this country... Uh, is thought to be the one who is the provocateur, or at least in Taiwan, right? China. Now, what is your view of China and the narrative that they are going to attack Taiwan? Could they, in fact, be the pacifist? And, I mean, at least history suggests that there might be an element of truth to that because they've never really colonized, colonized in the Western sense of the word. Do you think they could be the, the non-aligned pacifist movement here? Do you think? What, what is your read of China generally? I think right now with the new Cold War, China is a protagonist together with the US. Okay, we we cannot. So that's indisputable. I mean, that's as far as the US that's is concerned. That, yeah. You know, Russia is history. Okay, they 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 don't see Russia as the main antagonist. China is the main antagonist. Whether it's Bush or, sorry, not no, not not Bush. Whether it's Obama, since Obama, but especially with Trump, and now with Biden. China is the the enemy, so you know, um, and and as far as most Southeast Asian countries are concerned, they are quite happy with China. So the you know it's it's not as if uh, they but n nobody in, even in Southeast Asia really wants to get into becoming simply a China China vessel. Okay, we want to do business with everybody. We e want to be friends with exactly. everybody. Exactly, but right. you know there are not many countries. We are not necessarily being given that choice. Okay, I mean, for example, in the mid nineteen sixties, you are probably too young to remember this, but you know, in the mid nineteen sixties, the UK withdrew east of Suez. Okay, east of Suez. The the naval base in 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 woodlands in Singapore was closed down, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the UK, n nobody invited them. They have an aircraft carrier in East Asia. Okay, who invited the the? They built two aircraft carriers. One is in off in the Atlantic. The other one is here. Who invited them? I don't remember anybody, Singapore or, or even, uh, inviting them. But we have an aircraft carrier. Who invited them? They are all trying to, you know, and a lot of the of the dirty work, which is in the West, is being done by the UK. 
the UK may not, and the UK doesn't even want to be part of Europe anymore since post Brexit. So we have a very dangerous situation where everybody wants to fight a war here, okay, and we don't really want to fight the war here. Thankfully, you know, the 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 attempt to try to get India as part of this as involved in 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 fighting with 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 China may may not actually uh, may may come a bit unstuck, uh, you know. Uh, because I I don't think Modi has a particular interest in 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 fighting with China. Do you, do you remember fifty years ago? Uh, you you've talked about this quite extensively, Prof. Um, you travelled um, from the west all the way to Madras in India. I think um, overland you you backpacked. I think Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, then India, then down south, and it was quite seminal for you in terms of being a life changing moment. I mean. The world in the early 70s was a very different world than it is today. Or maybe it's very similar in terms of the fear, uncertainty and doubt, right? What do you think has changed in that 50 years? And how do you think it's going to unfold again in the next 50? Oh, that's a huge question. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> what has changed in the last 50 years? Can you do that so, in so many two th- minutes? <laughs> uh, I mean... You know, it's interesting that part of the reason younger people think it was such an incredible trip is because it seemed so difficult to cross all these borders. You know, there was war here, there's war here and there and so on and so forth. Ironically, it was relatively easy for somebody like me to to cross all these borders. The only place I had a problem was going from Pakistan to to India because there had been a war over Bangladesh the year before, you know, so uh, yeah, in in seventy one, so so I couldn't cross from from Pakistan to India, except through incredibly, there was only one flight a week from Lahore to Amritsar, very very short flight, fifteen minutes I think, but that flight was by. You won't guess. You won't guess who it is. Afghan Air, <laughs> the country which was neutral between Pakistan and India. Okay. Afghan Air flew from Lahore to Amritsar. You know, Afghan. a distance of about sixty kilometers. Yeah. So it's 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 a, such a different world, you know. So to begin to try to summarize the differences between that period, it was a simpler. It was a simpler world then, wasn't it? It was a much more naive world as well, wasn't it? And today we seem See, to be. And 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 some of the competition of the Cold War between the Soviet Union. I mean, for example, my first when I travelled as a student, the cheapest flights to get to get to Europe at least were with something called Aeroflot. Yeah, Russian so, Airlines. Yeah, yeah. That was the cheapest way to travel to 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 Europe, and and so it cut down uh, my you know what it made possible uh, international travel. Uh, you know, uh, today of course there are many other alternatives. Okay, but you know it was a it, so so. I'll give you another example of how some benign consequences. So, the Soviet Union challenged uh, Jimmy Carter, President of the U.S., to eradicate uh, smallpox in the world within a decade. In nineteen, I think it was nineteen seventy-nine, and sure enough. The the U.S. accepted the challenge, and smallpox has been history ever since the 19, mid uh, late nineteen eighties. Where there's a will, there's a way. So to all the world's problems today, if there was a if there was a will to do so, I think there is a way forward, right? I mean, you you don't have to fight, you don't have to, you know, argue. You can have peace and food and prosperity for all, can't you? I mean that right? C- these are all human decisions. We've made these problems, we can make them go away as well, can't we? You see, you can, you can, for example, do space exploration or other types of exploration with a view to sharing the, 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 the benefits of it. Yeah. Or you can do it and you can do it and say, ah, I have to do it because the other side is going to do it and they are going to do it to exclude us. And unfortunately, we are now in the second mode. The idea of international cooperation 
to challenge, to address the problems of humanity. It's just simply not there. So two years ago, or a year and a half ago, at Glasgow, the, the British, who only use about 2%, uh, coal accounts only for about 2% of the, of the electricity, they say, no more coal. And the world agrees to that. Less than half a year later, Europe is talking about going back to coal. They don't even have the capacity to, to generate much electricity. Going back to coal um, to, to, as a means to avoid using uh, importing uh, gas from Russia. I mean, you know, th we are regressing. We are not progressing. We are regressing. Instead of promoting solar panels, for example, no, we cannot because seventy percent of solar panels in the world are being produced in 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 China. Malaysia produces seven percent. We are number two together with with South Korea. But you know, and that's a huge opportunity, of course, for Malaysia. But you know, what 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 is the world doing rather than move, moving to renewables? And meanwhile, we now face the prospect of you know three years of 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 drought. Or, or at least low rainfall, the possibility that, that planting seasons are going to be cancelled in, in Kedah uh, and Perlis. Um, we are increasing water conflicts between Penang and, and, and Kedah and, and a whole host of problems because we don't have the maturity to, to, to try to, to, to think about non-conflictual outcomes. We don't have the impulse. We don't have, you know, what 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 um uh the 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 the, the chattering classes doing about that in well, Malaysia yeah. or in the world? One upmanship and uh, the lack of bipartisanship. Yeah, is a global problem, not just a Malaysian yeah. problem. By the time this recording comes out, you would have returned from your trip to northern Malaysia, where you're going to be spending nearly two weeks trying to get a feel on the ground of what life is like and trying to make sense of what's going on, uh, Prof. What conclusions would you like to have reached by the end of that trip? Well, my 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 concerns right now, are, you know, in in the five years before the pandemic, two planting seasons of rice were cancelled within within five years. Okay, that means twenty percent less rice produced in Malaysia. Now, I'm not one of those who believes that we should not import anything and that we should produce everything ourselves. I'm not one of those. But I'm really concerned that the farmers of Kedah and, 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 and Sabrang Prai and, and so on are going to, to, be, to be in a very untenable situation. We need to begin to think seriously about this. We need to begin to think about how we have done things to undermine the viability of water supplies at the global level, some of it beyond our, our means to address and some, some within our means to address. We need to find cooperative solutions rather than, confl than, than, than conflicting solutions to, to a whole host of problems. But we don't have enough pressure to do so. We don't have enough encouragement for, you know, for, for people to think about these issues and to begin to address them. Instead, there are so many incentives to become part of the influencers who say vote this, vote that, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, rather than begin to think, you know, how, this, how, how to unite this nation against the problems which we face as a nation and beyond uh, the, 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 these, these national problems. They there can, are so many ho a host of problems for us to address. There can be no higher pri priority than food security. And I know rice production and the whole study of rice and, and food is you know, one of the centerpieces of Kazana Research Institute, of which I think you're part of. Prof, I mean, let, let's, let's close off the, the discussion, I think, with basically your rules for life, right? Uh, how would you advise the younger folk to try and navigate this crazy, strange world you know, we're in today? How would you advise them to say, hey, this is how maybe you should think about approaching this craziness? You know, my children tease me that I'm really out of touch with the world. And I admit to some of this because I think in trying to keep my mind 
up to date on what is happening in the larger world. I often don't spend enough time talking to younger people. I don't have enough of a sense of their priorities and so on. So, you know, people, people complain all too often that I'm always talking about, you know, a world which no longer exists and a future which, which you know, which is beyond the next year and so on and so forth. I'm talking about, uh, and, and uh, I plead guilty to many of these problems, but it also means I'm out of touch. I don't know how to address many of these problems. So I think, I think, I think, I think if I was in a better position to do so, I would like to think that those people with in positions of influence, and the positions of influence your generation or my generation would think about are quite different from what younger people th assume to be positions of influence. You know, I mean, until until fairly recently, I never even knew there was such a a, a, a occupation as an influencer. Okay. Unfortunately, they do, they do exist. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, yeah. So, what do we do then? What do we do to, to 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 how do we how do we infuse in them a sense, you know? Because influencers are usually invariably working for the interest people. groups, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, not necessarily interest groups, so for corporations, for for businesses, Brands and exactly stuff, exactly, and yeah. political parties, yeah, and political agendas. So what do what do we do in in the face of all this? I really don't know. But you know, freeing up the media, as many of us thought might be the solution long ago, now does not seem to be necessarily the the answer. We need to go beyond that. Or how do we have much more positive messages? And and I really fear that you know that our methods are passe, very very passe. And so, you know, part of my reason for 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 being thrilled by this prospect is precisely this opportunity to reflect on this. But I'm not sure it's going to make much of an impact. You know, I'm really not sure that that we are really reaching the people and 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 having the kind of impact which is necessary to begin to to be consequential. Well, a journey of a thousand miles, right? Single step, Doppler effect. And then it just cascades outwards. Maybe I mean, it seems to me that the world is made up of a whole bunch of you know forces of good and evil. Uh, hopefully, this can be a force for good, and people can be influenced to do the right thing in their life. You know, whether in business or in their personal life. So, you know, thank you, Prof, for spending time with us. Um, thank you for your thoughts. Hopefully, we can navigate this mad world and and have another fifty hundred years of peace and prosperity. At least one hopes. Thank you once again. Thank you for this opportunity.